I'm Aaron Woodrick. I'm Franco Terrazano. And this is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. This week in our deep dive, our Atlantic and Quebec director, Renaud Brossard, will be offering a cautionary tale about government childcare. And in Waste Watch, we're going to talk about how French university students in Ontario are costing taxpayers $400,000 each. So stay tuned for that. But first, let's check in with our Alberta director, Franco Terrazano. Franco. Well, everyone, mark your calendars for the week of February 22nd, and that's because that's when the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is heading to the Alberta Court of Appeal to fight Trudeau's Bill C-69, or as we like to call it here in Alberta, Trudeau's No More Pipelines Law. And, and really, the lack of pipelines is costing us a ton of jobs, and it's really impacting our economy but a lack of pipelines is also harming taxpayers. And that's because when politicians aren't getting that money from oil and gas, they come looking to taxpayers, the families, the mom and pop shops down the road to fill up that gap. And that's why we're going to court to fight Trudeau's No More Pipelines Law and to fight for taxpayers and to stick up for Canadian resources. Yeah, and it couldn't come too soon because we've seen what has happened with south of the border with new U.S. President Joe Biden pulling the plug on the Keystone XL permit on his first day in office. Didn't even wait a day to stick it to Canada. Um, so it seems more important than ever that we find ways to get pipelines built in Canada. Uh, because if we don't, we're just going to end up dragging taxpayers into more debt. Well, man, you really hit the nail on the head with that one. And, you know, I have received a ton of email, a ton of phone calls after Biden next the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, man, it really, really felt like a a punch to the gut here in Alberta. And, you know, it felt like Trudeau didn't go to bat for pipelines and he didn't go to bat for Canadian resources. And, you know, Trudeau even said that he understood that Biden was living up to a quote campaign promise by canceling the pipeline. Trudeau definitely didn't roll over like this when Alberta's premier, Jason Kenney, lived up to his campaign promise by scrapping the provincial carbon tax. But you know what might be the most disappointing thing in all this? is that Trudeau's inaction isn't even a surprise, right? I mean, after all, what was Trudeau going to do? He was going to call Biden up and tell Biden, you know, you know, we think the U.S. should let businesses build pipelines. Well, then Biden could have just fired back. Wait, aren't you the guy with the no more pipelines law in Canada? And he would have been right. Yeah, and just to clarify for our listeners, when Franco is talking about the no more pipelines law, he's talking about what was once Bill C-69. I think the official name in law is the Impact Assessment Act. Um, and it's a federal law that makes it really hard for pipelines to be approved through the regulatory process. And, and it's so damaging because this has been layered on top of what was already a very onerous, uh, you know, and rigorous regulatory process. In fact, it's so bad that the head of the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association said this about the bill and what is now the law. He said, it is difficult to imagine that a new major pipeline could be built in Canada under the Impact Assessment Act. My mother always said, never say never, but in the current environment, we can't see how one is going to be proposed. So that's pretty damning comments. Um, and it's important to point out that it's not really just this one act that's the problem. It's, it's that it's one of many bad policies that have hurt our ability to develop our resources and, and raise tax revenue. Well, that's right. I mean, let's look at the Keystone XL decision again. Um, now, Keystone XL being canceled wouldn't have been such a blow if we could have actually let businesses build pipelines in Canada, right? But instead, we had the feds reject the Northern Gateway pipeline. We had the feds move the regulatory goalposts on the Energy East pipeline. Then we had our political system here in Canada chase away the Kinder Morgan Company when it was trying to spend billions of its own dollars to expand the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Then you had Bill C-48 or Trudeau's discriminatory tanker ban on the West Coast. And of course, what we've been talking about here the whole time is Trudeau's No More Pipelines law. Yeah, and so when Alberta Premier Jason Kenney launched a legal court challenge in Alberta's Court of Appeal, uh, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we jumped on the chance to intervene. We were granted intervener status. So we'll all be in court the week of February 22nd to hear that challenge. And we're going to be arguing that this act, the Impact Assessment Act, it really blurs accountability between who should be governing resource development. Is it the province? Is it the federal government? Uh, and also the fact, most people will know, when too much government gets involved, there's a lot of waste and a lot of inefficiency. So having them both mixed up in this process is a real waste of taxpayer money. Uh, and there's one other reason that we're jumping into this fight. Uh, Franco, why don't you tell us all about it? 
Yeah, my pleasure. Well, you know, we knew we had to get into this fight because not only do pipelines impact our oil and gas industry, impact the economy, impact jobs, but pipelines also impact taxpayers. And, you know, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we calculated that taxpayers in Canada have already lost more than $6 billion between 2013 and 2018 because of the pipeline deficit here. And we can expect to lose another $3 million plus every single day until the end of 2023 if governments continue to get in the way of pipelines. And look, it's the simple truth. If oil and gas doesn't generate that revenue, then governments are going to start looking at families to pick up the tab. And this is the message that we've been taking across Canada. We took it across Canada in our 2019 National Pipeline Tour. And it's the message that we're going to be taking to the courts this February. Well, that's good news. And thanks so much for the update on that, Franco. Everyone should stay tuned because I'm sure we're certainly going to have a lot more to say on pipelines in the coming months. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes to an op-ed that Franco and I wrote for the Sun newspaper chain on how the pipeline deficit is costing taxpayers billions of dollars. And now let's check in with our Quebec and Atlantic director, Renaud Brossard, who's sounding the alarm over a potentially costly government childcare program. This is Deep Dive, the part of the show where we dive into important issues that Canadian taxpayers really need to know more about. I'm Chris Sims, and we've got our Quebec and Atlantic director, Renaud Broussard, here. Uh, he basically controls everything east of the Ottawa River. He's going <laughs> to tell us about government <laughs> child care in Quebec and why the push for a national government child care scheme is actually bad news for parents and taxpayers everywhere. Renaud. You happen to live in a province where government child care has been the norm and the gold standard for government child care pushers everywhere for the last 20 years or so. How has it actually worked so far? Thanks, Chris. And, you know, you made me sound like some Machiavellian villain saying I controlled everything east of Ottawa. But, uh, You're the no, emperor. You're my the my, my emperor premier's already Canada. making off of a mask here that I, I don't really have to do much. Um, but to, to get back to our main topic, Chris... Imagine you're standing in a really long line in front of a shop. You've been okay. standing there for a really long time. And when it's almost your turn, someone swoops in in front of you just at the last minute because, well, as he says, he knows the owner. And then he gets the last copy of the item you were going to buy. <laughs> How would that make you feel? Uh, I'd be pretty furious. There'd be some people's elbows dropping here right now. I wouldn't be very happy. <laughs> right. You, you know, it's, it is kind of frustrating. Well, if you replace that shop with a government daycare system and that last item with a spot for your child, that's exactly what's happening with Quebec's taxpayer-funded socialized daycare system. Hmm. Since the thing was first put in place 25 years ago, there have been chronic issues with a lack of capacity in the subsidized system. According to the latest estimates, there are about 46,000 children that are currently on a waiting list because they couldn't get into one of the 235,000 existing spots. That's one out of six kids. And that's despite every premier in the last quarter of a century promising to fix the issue once and for all. And you know, like anything that gets socialized and that has chronic shortages, uh, well, your ability to access it doesn't really depend just on your position on the list, but rather it comes down to who you know. Mm. And that's how, according to Quebec's Auditor General, there's about 30,000 kids a year that just get to bypass the entire waiting list system and get access to a daycare space simply because of who their parents know. It almost sounds like when you're trying to get a doctor in some parts of Canada. You know, it's this kind of government-sanctioned nepotism that makes people's blood boil because it's so fundamentally unfair. Those 30,000 parents who got bumped to the waiting list because they didn't know the right bureaucrat or daycare provider are still stuck paying for the system. They pay for it through their taxes. And on top of that, because they were denied access to what they've been paying for all these past years, they're going to end up having to pay out of pocket for their kids on top of subsidizing those who were actually connected enough to get a spot. You're absolutely right. And, you know, this isn't some new government scheme that just needs a few tweaks here and there because it's in its infancy. Heck, the thing is 25 years old. If it was a person, it could vote and get drunk. <laughs> it's a 25-year-old government scheme that has never worked and just keeps running as is. And unfortunately, as is too often the case, instead of trying to fix the issue or to look for better alternatives, Quebec politicians have just been throwing money at the problem year after year, thinking that just a couple million bucks more will just solve the issue. 
So this program that was supposed to pay for itself, as politicians put it, and which had a $300 million budget in 97, now costs Quebec taxpayers $2.7 billion a year. Even when you account for, the, for inflation, that's a six-fold increase in the scheme's price tag. I like how you said vote and get drunk instead of get drunk and vote, because that <laughs> might not work as well. Okay, so it's clear that Quebec's daycare system is pretty messy, but are there other places where it does actually work when it comes down to government daycare? So you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right that uh, Quebec's system is a complete mess. And it's kind of sad to see that government childcare advocates point to it as being a gold standard. But Quebec is not the only pr example of government childcare in Canada. Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador actually introduced a similar scheme just a couple of years ago, albeit mm. with larger parental contributions, but it has been plagued with the same accessibility issue. Latest data shows that 79% of childcare centers uh, in St. John's currently have long waiting lists. It hasn't worked much better out there than it did in Quebec. And even though the scheme is much more recent, we're seeing the same kind of explosion in cost. Even before Newfoundland and Labrador reduced a parental contribution to 25 bucks a day this year, the cost of the program had already gone up threefold within five years. So what we've seen happen, and you know, especially in Quebec, is that as the government moved in with bigger taxpayer subsidies to daycare centers, well, the unions moved in as well and tried to appropriate all of that money by negotiating ever bigger raises for their members with the government. And for all those taxpayer-funded childcare centers, as soon as they get access to government subsidies, they don't have any incentive to start being better or more efficient. Mm. They know they're going to be operating at full capacity forever as the waiting lists just get longer and longer and longer. See, we've had this problem before with other government type systems. So the biggest winners from government childcare programs were not the low and middle income parents and the families who need access to this kind of care, but rather the child care center owners and the unions themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is typical of government intervention in so many sectors. If I'm being generous, it usually starts out with good intentions earnestly but it always ends up being taken advantage of by either bureaucrats or government unions. We've seen this happen before with teachers unions, sadly, fighting against all initiatives to bring in more school choices in order to protect their own monopolies. And it's sad, and it's at the expense of local taxpayers and school-aged children. Yeah. But we got to get real. You know, childcare is a big cost for parents. It is. Uh, people need access to this kind of care. As it stands right now, it's far from being affordable for most people. Families where one person stays home, they take a huge financial hit. Uh, speaking personally, that's what we did for years on end. And not only does it cost you an immense amount of money because you're losing one income earner, it also puts that income earner back on their resume and their CV. It leaves a gap. And not every future employer looks kindly upon people who stayed home and raised their little kids. So I know it's hard. And I know there are single parents out there who rely on daycare. They need babysitters. They need daycare providers. They mm -hmm. need to get out there and work. So this is a real problem. And at the end of the day, most families need both adults out there working and earning money. That's just the way our economy is. Nothing is affordable anymore. And they need somebody to take care of their little kids while they're out working. So it's tough. So if government childcare isn't the answer, what could we actually do to help make childcare more affordable for Canadian families? You know, that's a really good question. And you raise a very important point about childcare affordability. We do need affordable childcare. And fortunately, government childcare just doesn't address that affordability issue. It doesn't make your childcare cheaper. It just means that instead of paying all of it on your daycare bill, you pay for a part of it on your tax bill and the other part in your daycare bill. The cost is the same. Mm. So if the government can't reduce the cost of childcare, what it can do to make it affordable is to make sure that parents have enough money in their pockets to pay for all their childcare needs. And the best way to do so, at least when it comes to government, is by taking less cash out of those parents' pockets. Study after study has shown that the biggest source of expense for Canadian families, it's not their home, it's not food, it's not their childcare expenses, it's all the income, gas, product-specific sales, carbon taxes that they pay to every kind of government. 
That's exactly the point here. You know, instead of taxing parents to the point where they can't afford childcare, even while they're both out working and just working to just live and get by and try to make ends meet, then trying to solve it through various subsidy programs that they in turn need to pay for, the government should just cut out the middleman here. And the middleman is them. They should leave those funds in families' pockets so they can make the childcare choices that best fits their needs. Because this one-size-fits-all big government solution to this is expensive and it's taxing us to death and it's not going to work. So if they did it this way, if they cut themselves out, if they cut out the middleman and didn't tax us so hard, that would mean that parents could then hire their own child care providers that suits their schedules. They could afford for maybe their grandparents to stay with them and watch the kids. Or they could actually afford for one parent to stay home or work part-time while those kids are little. You know, thank you so much for bringing this issue to our attention. We appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. This is Waste Watch, the part of the show where we make fun of all the stupid ways governments are wasting your hard-earned tax dollars. I'm the CTF's Quebec director, Renaud Brassard, and I'll be speaking with our Ontario director, Jasmine Moulton, about the Université de l'Ontario Français, Ontario's new French university, also dubbed UOF. What's going on, Jasmine? The Ontario and federal governments just launched a new university, as you say, in Toronto. But Renault, get this. It only got 39 applicants, not even <laughs> students, just people who might attend the school this fall. So when you break down the cost per uh, applicant, that means that at the current rate, we'll be spending at least $400,000 each. Oh, wait, $400,000 per student? At this point, you could give them like a four-year scholarship to Harvard and still save money. <laughs> yeah, you raise a good point that shows just how wasteful this is. But I have to admit, it really is one of the more wasteful stories that I've seen during my time here at the CTF. But just to paint the full picture for our listeners, we really need to rewind back to 2018. So picture this, you've got Ontario's newly elected government, the PCs, headed by Premier Doug Ford. They swept into office and immediately scrapped plans from the previous Liberal government in Ontario to build this new French university in Toronto. And they were right to do so. At the time, they said, look, Ontario can't afford this. And again, they were correct in that statement. <laughs> but if you fast forward to 2019, Ford caved to political pressure, sadly, and decided to jointly fund Ontario's new French university with the federal government. Now, Ford and Trudeau each generously pitched in $63 million for a total of $126 million of taxpayers' money to be spent on UOF over eight years. Now, if you fast forward again to the present, here's where this gets so wasteful. Keep in mind, so this fall is when the university will open its doors for the first time. And news just broke that as of the application deadline in mid-January, only 39 people in total had applied to the school. And of those 39 applicants, only 19 are current Ontario students. That means that the <laughs> remainder are either mature adults from the community wanting to take some courses at the school, or they're just applying from outside Ontario. But that means that if every single applicant is both admitted by the school and chooses to accept that admissions offer, which of course is highly unlikely that both of those things would happen, that means that each student would cost taxpayers over $400,000 this year alone. You know, I, I still can't believe it. $400,000 per student? Well, it gets even worse. So documents from Ontario's University Application Center, OUAC, show that as of the deadline to apply, only two of the 19 Ontario students who applied actually listed the new French university as their first choice. So only two Ontario students really want to go to this school uh, that the provincial and federal government just spent millions of dollars on this year. <laughs> well, that, that's just incredible. It'll be interesting to wait and see how many students actually end up attending the Université de l'Ontario Français de Sol. Because as you say, not every applicant will be accepted or, you know, actually choose to attend. But let me play devil's advocate. Some supporters of the, of the school might argue that applications for universities are down across the board because of COVID-19. 
So that could explain some of the lack of interest. You know, I've heard that, but actually, we know I looked at the numbers and they show that at least from OUAC, that applications in Ontario increased this year by more than 2% um, as mm-hmm. of January 2021 compared to the year prior in January 2020 before COVID really took hold. So I should point out that applications were up even at the University of Ottawa in 2021 uh, compared to the year prior in 2020. And I note this because the University of Ottawa, our listeners may not know, is the world's largest English-French bilingual university. I went there for my undergrad, and so I happen to know you can take classes, write tests, submit papers in either official language, French or English. That's why this is so mind-boggling to me. If strengthening French post-secondary education in Ontario was the goal here, then the government could have done much more for a fraction of the cost simply by directing some of those funds to the University of Ottawa instead of building an entirely new French university in Toronto that almost nobody wants to attend. Or, you know, and hear me out here. You could just get in your car, drive a couple of hours down the road to Montreal and take as many French classes as you want. (laughs) I think you raise a great point, Renaud, because I had to move seven hours away from my parents' home in southwestern Ontario for my undergrad when I, again, went to the University of Ottawa. So I don't think that the government should get into this business of building universities that we can't afford just so that students don't have to move to go to school. I mean, what are these students expecting when they graduate that they won't have to move to get a (laughs) job? Um, But I do want to be clear for our listeners that I actually think it's really important to be able to study French in Ontario because Ontario has a significant French speaking population here. So I wouldn't have any issue with this school if there was overwhelming demand for it. It's just that the numbers show that's not the case. So for me, this really has nothing to do with the school being French, just to be clear. I'm just annoyed that these two governments spent over a hundred million bucks of taxpayers' money on a university that nobody wants to attend. But I have to say, I was curious, so I did do some digging, and I found out that Ontario actually has nine French language and bilingual schools that already offer university programs, as well as two publicly funded French language colleges. So it's just simply not the case that there's no French post-secondary options available in Ontario. Okay, but let me play devil's advocate again. Some people who support Ontario's new French university in Toronto have said that it's it's only the first year, so we should relax, enrollment will increase over time. Uh, why would you respond to them? I mean, that doesn't change the fact that they're still spending millions of dollars on a school that almost nobody will be attending this year. So it really just makes this look like the government's failed to do adequate market research and or this was just a costly political decision. And it really is crazy to think that these two governments decided to go ahead with this $126 million project that has almost no demand when both governments are broke. So at the time that they decided to go ahead with this, Ontario's debt had just surpassed $350 billion. Canada's, had appro- Canada's was approaching $700 billion. When we look at this in retrospect, they probably could have used (laughs) that $126 million right about now for, oh, I don't know, maybe healthcare or long-term care or vaccines. But now we have this new expensive university that nobody wants to attend. Ontario's debt is now approaching $400 billion, and Ottawa's debt just surpassed $1 trillion. So... What does that work out to on a per person basis? Uh, Just to break it down for our listeners. So if you go to debtclock.ca, it shows our per capita share of the federal debt has now surpassed $27,000. So whatever province you live in, that's your share, your individual share of the federal government's debt. And then tack on another $26,000 if you live in Ontario as your portion of the provincial government's debt. So that means that if you live in Ontario now, your portion of combined federal and provincial government debt has now surpassed 50,000 bucks, which of course for a family of four means that, you know, your future tax liability with this government debt is now over $200,000. But a really crazy stat just came out of a report that showed the combined federal and provincial debt to GDP ratios of every province from Ontario to the East coast has now surpassed 100%. Now what that means 
in English for our listeners is that even if the federal and provincial governments took out every single dollar from the economy of those provinces for an entire year, it still wouldn't pay off the debt. You know, this is a really important point. It's going to take a whole lot of time to pay off the debts our governments have been racking up. And that means that future generations, our kids and grandkids, will be the ones stuck paying for all of what we're spending today. Exactly, Renault. And that's why I always say that advocates for education should always first be fierce advocates for debt reduction. Because the more that our taxes go toward interest payments, the less we have to spend on education or any other program for that matter. So Mm -hmm. consider this, Ontario will spend 12 and a half billion on interest payments on our debt this year, but we're only spending 11 billion on colleges and universities. So if Ontario didn't have this debt problem, we could have saved that interest money and spent it on something else that we care about. We could have doubled our spending on colleges and universities, for example, if that's what taxpayers wanted. Uh, And in fact, this is kind of a funny example to demonstrate just how wasteful it is. Um, The money that we spent on interest payments this year could have paid for 99 new French universities in Ontario. (laughs) Not that there's even enough demand for one, but you get my point. All I know this point, Jasmine, uh, clearly governments have room to save money, even during a pandemic. And the Université d'Ontario Français, which once again, was only the top choice of two Ontario students, is proof that not all current spending is necessary or even related to the pandemic. All right, that's the show. Thanks so much for listening. And a huge shout out and huge thank you to our investigative journalist and our podcast editor, James Wood, for making it sound like we know what we're talking about. And remember, if you want to help us spread the word, you can like and share on all the social media channels. The more people that hear our message, uh, the more people we can get pressing on these issues. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening and thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.